Hey, Jim Hoffman here for EMS Office Hours. This is your Monday Minutes. So uh, we're going to continue on here with the anatomy and physiology part of the EMS quick study uh, guide and quick study tips here. Um, and But we're getting a little bit more in-depth into some more uh, real meaty stuff of what really affects us and we, what we see more and what we document more of as EMS professionals, okay? So, of course, we always address why this stuff is important. Um, and, again, it's important for exam prep because the stuff that I'm showing you here are the key items, the highlights of what you're going to see on many, many EMS exams throughout your EMS career. But it's also important because it makes you a better provider by refreshing on this content so you can document better, you can understand what's happening with your patient better, you can uh, communicate better with your uh, M ER docs and ER nurses, okay, so it all ties in. It's not just about studying for a test. The content that you learn as an EMS professional should really be focused on you as a more well-rounded uh, provider, okay? So, again, we're in the respiratory system, and again, quick overview, because as you know, if you've taken uh, your respiratory system classes before, this could be one, two, or even three-day lectures, by your paramedic instructor but i do encourage you that while this is a quick overview should something not ring true to you or should you not understand something go ahead crack open that textbook look it up and study on what it is that you're missing and this is my goal through these is to encourage you to review more to research more and to get more out of these quick videos by looking deeper into things you don't understand. And then I think you'll find when it comes to exam time and it comes to your assessment and your documentation, you're going to find you're, you're much more well-versed in this content. So let's get into the respiratory system, guys. In short, what does it do? Of course, we know it brings oxygen in and it gets rid of CO2, right? And it's made up of your upper and lower airways. Now, it's important to know the upper and lower airway. I just want to go quickly over the major components here, right? Your upper airway is your nasal cavity, your oral cavity, your nose, your mouth, your pharynx, which, of course, then is broken down into three separate sections, your nasal pharynx, your oral pharynx, and your laryngopharynx. Now, keep in mind, something you might see on a test is that might ask you where the epiglottis is located, I might ask you where the molecular is located because this ties into your skills of intubation, right? Or skills of using a king airway or some other sort of airway management device, right? So you know where it's going. So keep that in mind and take a look at that if you're not quite sure where that all falls in place with your upper airway, okay? But it actually is down in your uh, laryngopharynx area, okay? It's right behind it, all right? So keep that in mind when you're thinking about upper airway and where the epiglottis is or the vallecula is, okay, and where where it prevents the food from getting into your respiratory tract, okay? Now, your lower airway, we have the larynx, the trachea, your bronchi, which can which goes to your, your right and left bronchi, right? That's where we intubate, and we, if you go too deep, it goes, you know, too much to, to, to the right, right? Um, and then, of course, finally, to your alveoli, where the gas exchange happens, now, some of you might be saying, well, Jim, the larynx could be in the upper airway as well. And that is true. It depends upon what uh, textbook you're using or who you speak to. But I've gone by sort of majority rules. I've checked a few different textbooks uh, on this. And most of them are all saying that the larynx is part of your lower airway, from the larynx down to your alveoli. Now, that's right below the higher bone. So if you look at it on an A&P chart or A&P graph, it'll pretty much clear to you that the larynx is where the lower airway will start, okay? So I don't want anybody emailing me and telling me that I'm wrong. Uh, it depends upon who you're speaking to and, and, and what textbook you're using, but majority start with the larynx. Okay, enough of that. Study this page here, guys. These are your main sections of your upper and lower airways. You probably will see this stuff on an exam at some point or be asked to list which is the upper airway and which is the lower airway. Now, a quick tip on that. When you see this on an exam, usually it'll ask you what components are the upper airway. It'll list them in a line, right? 
nasal cavity, oral cavity, pharynx, whatever. Now, of course, if you see bronchi coupled with nasal cavity, you know that's wrong. If you see alveoli coupled with the pharynx, you know it's wrong. All right, so if you see something in the lower airway mixed in with the upper airway, you know it's wrong and vice versa. So just keep that in mind that even though you have everything, you know, all your upper airway structures might be listed, if you see something from the lower airway posted there as one of the choices, the choice is going to be wrong, right? So keep that in mind. Read the full answers and the full question when you're taking tests, guys. All right. Respiratory system, keeping going here. You know, basically, ventilation. This is defined as moving the CO2 in and out of the lungs. Now, oxygenation, ox, I can't even say it now. Oxygenation is defined as moving oxygen in and out of the lungs. And resp respiration as a whole is the entire process. Now, when we continue on a little bit here, the CO um, transport, the majority of it, is done in the form of bicarbonate ions. Now, of course, this is becomes important when we start talking about um, acid base and stuff like that, and that's going to be in about two weeks, I believe, we're going to start getting into the acid base balance and electrolytes. Um, but and this is where the bicarbonate ions become important, and that CO two um, uh, levels become important, right? This is when you talk about the acid base. Okay, now your brainstem regulates the respiration. Okay, and it, it senses that excess CO2, causing it to increase ventilation, or it might sense lowered CO2 and start to decrease uh, ventilation. So it's based upon the levels of CO2 that the brainstem is sensing. Okay, now of course you've got a backup system. You might have heard of the hypoxic drive, right? And this is more sensitive to oxygen but it's not fine-tuned, okay? So, you know, mainly, you know, your, 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 ba your main thing is your brain stem, okay? Just sort of sidebars here. I know it's not all part of the system itself. Some of this is acid base and things like that, but I want to mention it since it is part of the respiratory cycle and respiratory system and what gets regulated and increases, decreases ventilation and all that. Now, I want to talk real quick. Um, this is sort of a, sort of an, uh, an added thing here. When you look at the pulse ox, right, your SpO2 readings on your monitor, or maybe you have a, a simple sort of finger regulatory device that senses the uh, SpO2 on your patient. This measures the percentage of um, hemoglobin in the blood that's bound to the oxygen. All right. Now I put this down here because again depending upon textbooks, depending upon your protocols, uh, some will say 94% is your goal, right, as your, min as your minimum um, percentage. Uh, anything below 94%, you want to start to uh, give them supplemental, supplemental oxygen. Some will say 96% is your goal, all right, or that most people are above 96%, but we have to keep in mind as EMS providers, we encounter many, many different patients with many, many different uh, illnesses, and they can have long-term illnesses that where their SpO2 is chronically lower than 96%, maybe even lower than 94%, where they're always on oxygen, right? So your SpO2 is a tool. It gives you a reading. It helps you with your diagnosis. But of course, we are we are assessing the entire patient, right? So we're looking at their history. We're looking at their current illness, their past illnesses, their medications, are they on oxygen, all of that, right? The history of smoking or not smoking, asthma, COPD, all that good stuff ties in, right? So it's just a measurement of the percentage of hemoglobin, but we want to look at the overall percentage. And again, depending upon your, your guidelines or what book you read, you might see where it says 94% is your goal. That's where I am. And my protocol in the system that I work in, 94% is the goal. Lower than that, we want you to start giving oxygen. Okay? And, of course, you have the whole um, conversation about how ox too much oxygen can be harmful to patients. 
right? So keep that all in mind. Follow your goal, your guidelines, and what your percentages are, are are supposed to be, and what your percentage goals are. All right. So that's it, guys, for the Rift Story system. I know this was a little bit of a longer um, Monday minutes, but I wanted to, you know, kind of cover some of those key elements of the Rift Story system. Please go back and watch this video again. Anything that you want to go more in depth in, maybe it's the upper airway structures, maybe it's talking about uh, CO2 and its regulation by the brainstem, look at it more in depth in your textbook, okay, when you have some time. Take that half hour and do a quick refresh study up on that, all right? Next time, guys, going to start talking about digestive and the gastrointestinal systems, all right, and the anatomy there and all that good stuff. All right, so we'll talk about that next time. That should be a pretty, um, I think, fun and interesting uh, session because we're going to break down, you know, upper quadrant, lower quadrants, all that good stuff. All right, guys, of course, I hope you can use these Monday Minutes. All right, I'm hoping that they're helping you with your exams, with your patient care, with your assessment and documentations. All right, um, if you have minutes of your own, you want to suggest something, send them over to me. My email is contact at emsofficehours.com um, and you know any questions or concerns with this this episode send that to me as well maybe I can clarify something for you maybe I can go more in depth something for you okay um, all that type of stuff is great all right and if you are a member of Turbo Medic and you see something here you don't quite understand you can join me on one of the monthly live uh, workshops that we do and we can talk about it live on video right here online on the interwebs all right all right so again that's it for me uh, guys if you enjoy this type of stuff and you want to really get down to the nitty-gritty and get the basics like I'm talking about the key elements that you're gonna see on your EMS exams I encourage you to consider uh, obtaining this quick study guide this is a digital guide you download it to your computer so you have it forever Okay, I have used this guide numerous times. I have recommended it to everyone I can because I'm telling you this is something that will help you on your exams. All right, it's going to break down, get rid of that five, six hundred page textbook, give it to you all in about a hundred or so pages so that you can really drill down to the key elements. And on top of that, by looking at it, you can maybe even figure out where you're struggling, where you're weak, and go ahead and get that textbook open and look more into those areas all right all right so click here for details if you're interested in this at all um, and that's pretty much it yeah again any questions comments send them over to me the email once again is contact at emsofficehours.com until next time as always I am Jim Hoffman stay safe <laughs>